I'm on my way back to New York today, and I'm going to tell them that uh, Philadelphia is an amazing place where people are on fire for God, where instead of going out on uh, Friday and Saturday night and partying, you partied in church, for most of you, and we had an incredible time. Uh, that beautiful lady next to me is my wife, and she is with me, but she's over at the other facility. I think she's going to be slipping in the back at some point during this service, and so uh, she'll get to join us today. Um, I, I, I jokingly said last night that we want you all to transfer to Nyack College, that it's cheaper and we'll give you more scholarships, but none of that's true. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I would like you to, uh, to say, if the Lord is calling you to go to seminary, to at least consider Alliance Theological Seminary, because uh, we're a seminary that was founded uh, a little over 50 years ago by missionaries. And so people like Tess that had a vision and a passion for taking Christ to the nation said, we want to form a graduate school that will help equip missionaries theologically, biblically, but also integrating that with anthropology and understanding how to do contextual theology because you can't preach the same way everywhere. You can preach the eternal message of Christ, but you've got to change the method and the means by which you communicate that so that people can grasp it and understand it. And so Alliance Theological Seminary is all about that. Uh, you do, do get biblical and theological education, but it's with an understanding of anthropology and missiology as well. So if you're thinking of seminary, consider us, and we actually have online programs as well. well with that said, let me uh, pray and we'll launch into the word this morning. Father, your presence here has been rich and sweet. We love what you're doing uh, here at GCC and in Philadelphia. We ask God for revival to sweep the Northeast. Uh, I've been praying for the last few years, Lord, that the fires of the Great Awakening would return again and that New York and Philadelphia and New England would be swept uh, into just a wave of your presence. And Lord, we pray for our friends that don't yet know you. We pray that they would fall madly in love with you. And Lord, would you use us? Would you do a work in us that would make Jesus so attractive in us and through us that our friends would begin to ask, what is the reason for the hope you have? and that we would be able to communicate that clearly. Empower us now, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, when I was pastoring in California uh, quite a few years ago now, uh, one of the things we noticed at, at one point in our church is that we had a lot of 12, 13, 14-year-old young men that did not have father figures. And so we had a really strong men's ministry, and the men's ministry of our church stepped up, and they... Um, they put together this discipleship program for young men, ages 12, 13, and 14. And, and we equipped their fathers, if they had fathers, and if they didn't have fathers, we assigned a man in the church to kind of mentor them. And we went through a 12-week process of mentoring these young men, doing discipleship with them, having fun with them as well. We took them bowling, we did crazy stuff with them. But then we closed that 12-week season with kind of a rites of passage retreat where the mentors and the young men they were mentoring, we went off on this retreat. We called the retreat Boys to Men, B-O-Y-Z to Men. We s stole it from a group, obviously. And, uh, and so we, we went off, we had this incredible weekend together. Well, the final night of the retreat, it was on Saturday night, we did this rites of passage thing, where the men of the church lined up in the front, and we formed like a tunnel. And, and the, the young men stood on one end, and then the father or the mentor stood at the other. And then the father would say, Bryce Walborn, you are God's beloved son on whom his favor rests. Come forth into your destiny as a man of God. And then this young 12, 13, 14-year-old young man would walk down that tunnel of fire, and the men of the church would lay hands on him and pray over him and prophesy his destiny. It was, it was an incredible moment. And these young men are walking down this hall. Well, at one point during this rites of passage kind of ceremony, um, one of the men in the church, who was one of our elders, came up to me. His name was John Barker, and John was like 80 years old. And you gotta understand, John had been a Marine in World War II. He had stormed the beaches of Iwo Jima. He was a man's man. He was a godly man. Um, and, and he came up to me and he goes, hey, Pastor Ron, I wanna walk down that hall. And I looked at him and I go, John, come on, you're, yeah, you're one of our elders and, and you're God's man and everybody knows you and respects you. You don't need to walk down that hall. And he goes, no, 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 God's not done with me yet. God has more for me. I want to go to the next level of empowerment for what God has me, for me in this next season. And so John Barker stood down at that 
end of the tunnel and, and I, I stood at the other end and I said, John Barker, you are God's beloved son on whom his favor rests. Come forth into your destiny as a man of God. And this 80 year old man walked down that tunnel as men prayed over him. Well, that just broke everything open. Every guy in the church wanted to walk down the hall, you know, at that point. In fact, we didn't get out of there until like two in the morning. But the reason I tell you that story is that I think many Christians get stuck in their walk with God. We get stuck and we stop growing. We don't have the attitude that that 80-year-old guy had saying, God's got more for me and I want to go to the next level. And the truth is, I think you can get stuck in your 20s as well as in your 30s, in your 40s, in your 50s. And you see, I believe God always has more for us. When I was a kid, I grew up in church. My dad was a pastor. And we used to have these things on Sunday night called testimony meetings. And, uh, and this one guy who was the grumpiest, meanest guy in our church would stand up every Sunday night, and he would stand up and he would go, I praise God that 35 years ago I was saved and baptized and sanctified. And I always wanted to add, and petrified, you know. <laughs> Because I remember thinking, I don't know what he has, but I don't want it. Now, I don't know what happened 35 years ago, but the truth is there was not much happening right now. And, and the scripture is very clear. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says we are to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. If you read it in the Greek, there's a continuous state of action. It's not just a one-time experience with the Holy Spirit, but we are to be being continuously filled and refilled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the old English pastor, said, the reason I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit every day is because I leak. And the truth is, we're supposed to leak. We are supposed to spill out the things of God on everyone and anyone we come into contact with. So this morning, I, I want to talk a little bit about the filling of the Holy Spirit through the Scriptures. Because sometimes I think that the Holy Spirit only showed up in Acts, but the truth is we see evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit all through the Scriptures, and you see the Holy Spirit filling people, coming upon people, empowering people to take them to the next level. And, and kind of the theme of this talk is this, God has more for you. You see, I, I don't care whether you were saved, you know, yesterday or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. The truth is your salvation is just the doorway into the things of God. God has more for you. And you can see this all through the scriptures. And I want to start, first of all, with a passage in Numbers 11. And, and here we find a prayer of Moses. And Hopefully you guys can see this too. If not, you can kind of follow along in your Bibles if you have them. But in, in Numbers chapter 11, Moses is at a point of frustration with the people. And, and we, we kind of begin to look in on this conversation that Moses is having with God. And it says this in verse 10, Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tents. And the Lord became exceedingly angry and Moses was troubled. And he asked the Lord, why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Now, if you've been in leadership for longer than 10 minutes, you've prayed this prayer, okay? <laughs> I, I'm serious, and it doesn't even have to be church leadership. Just leading anybody will bring you to this place of, what have I done to you, God, that you made me do this, okay? Um, and in fact, just you know, thank the good Lord that you're not a dean, because I have to lead faculty, okay? And you have to sit and listen to faculty, but I have to try to organize faculty, and that's kind of like, kind of like herding cats. You know, it, it's a difficult <laughs> occupation, all right? So Moses is at this point of frustration. He's crying out to God, and, and then I love the raw honesty when Moses prays. And it, it's a really good template for us to use. He says this. In fact, he gets sarcastic with God. <laughs> By the way, God loves sarcasm, so we're all safe, all right? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing and whining to me. Give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're gonna treat me, please go ahead and kill me. <laughs> I love that prayer, okay? <laughs> If I have found favor in your eyes, take me out right now, God, okay? Don't let me face my own ruin. So here, here's Moses, man, he's frustrated. He's saying this, 
Uh, I can't do this alone, and I can't do this on the strength that I have presently. And I love God's answer. The Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people and have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you. And I will come down and speak with you there and I will take some of the power of the spirit that is on you and put it on them and they will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. And, and here's where we find one of the purposes of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. It's to help you carry the burden of the people. You see, when God calls you to leadership, he does not call you to do it in your own strength. He has more for you. And so Moses obeys the Lord, and it, he went out, and he told the people what the Lord had said, and he brought together 70 of their elders, and he had them stand around the tent. And then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with him, and he took some of the power of the Holy Spirit that was on him, and he put it on the 70 elders, and when the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, and they continued to do so. Now, if you have your Bibles open, you'll notice that that's an alternate reading. The one reading there says, they prophesied but did not do so again. But based on the Hebrew and based on what happens next, I believe the better reading is that they continued to do so. Why? Because there were two guys that were supposed to come to the meeting that did not show up. Now, catch this. This is the most important meeting of their lives, and they missed the meeting. Okay? Uh, these two guys' name were Eldad and Medad. Okay? Those are interesting Hebrew names. Okay? And they remained in the camp. And I don't know if they were afraid, I don't know if they didn't have their schedules set, but they didn't show up. They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. But check out the goodness of God. Yet the Spirit rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. And, and from the context, the prophecy that they were moving in was a continuous. They continued to prophesy. So someone goes out and reports this to Moses. Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. You see, this continuous prophetic is moving. And Joshua, son of Nun, who, by the way, he had been Moses' aide since youth. He was Moses' right-hand man. He speaks up, and the spirit of a pastor comes on him. He says, Moses, make them stop. Stop it now. I'm, I'm doing crowd control here. Now, let me explain what's going on. In this season of God's uh, ministry among men, the only person that got the Holy Spirit was one older Jewish man. And that's the only person. And, and the next person to get the Spirit was the guy that was mentored by that man. And Joshua was Moses' right-hand man. He was next in line to get the Spirit. Well, now all of a sudden, uh, things begin to get out of control. And these 70 elders, including two guys that didn't even show up for the meeting, have the Holy Spirit come upon them. They begin to prophesy. And Joshua's like, hey, wait a minute. I'm next in line. And he says, Moses, make them stop. And I love Moses' response here. And, it, and it's, it's kind of a response to Joshua, but it's also a prayer. And Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? And you know the answer to that question, if Joshua were being honest, is actually, no, I'm jealous for my sake. Because I was supposed to be the next guy, and now these 70 dudes have jumped in in front of me. And Moses then says this, I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on all of them. And then Moses and the elders of Israel turned to the camp. Now, folks, here's where we begin to see a progression in Scripture. You see, it starts out that the Holy Spirit is very exclusive on one individual for one season. But now Moses' prayer begins to usher in a season where the Spirit of God moves from exclusivity to inclusivity. That the Spirit of God is not going to be limited to just one person at one time in one place for one job. No, there's coming a day where Moses' prayer is going to be answered. And you see this reflected in a prophecy in Joel. When Joel says, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your, your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Now, I want to remind you, Joel is prophesying to Judah. I want to remind you of how radical this prophecy would have been. 
because they were not used to this movement of exclusivity to inclusivity. And Joel is saying, no, 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 it's not just the old and it's not just the men. There is coming a day when the spirit is gonna be poured out on young and old men and women, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And so as you move through the scriptures, you see this movement of the spirit giving more empowerment, launching people into next level kind of living, moving from exclusivity to inclusivity. And so you move from Moses' prayer to Joel's prophecy, and then you come to Jesus. And Jesus gives a promise. And, and, and you can see it in numerous places in the ministry of Jesus. He promises that he's going to send the comforter. But in John chapter 20, this is post-resurrection, he is gathering and meeting with the disciples. And, and he says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, folks, what's happening here in John chapter 20 is radical. What's happening here, I believe this, and, and a number of scholars believe, that Acts chapter 2 is not the initiation of the church age, that actually that's happening in John chapter 20, in Matthew 28, when the church is commissioned with the new covenant gospel message. And this moment is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit for the first time in these disciples, bringing about the new birth and the new covenant initiation moment. Now, to be honest, most of us have heard that Acts chapter two is the initiation of the church age. I actually believe it occurs at the end of the gospels. I believe that Acts chapter two is significant, but it's really the first empowerment of the church. Now, one of the things that you and I have been taught, and you've heard it, how many of you have heard in the Old Testament the Holy Spirit came upon people for ministry, but in the New Testament, he indwells people. How many of you heard that? Well, that's true. It's a true statement. But the inference there is that once he indwells you, he no longer comes upon you for power. And I want to tell you, I don't believe that's true. I think the Holy Spirit comes upon his people again and again and again, and I think the filling or the coming upon of the Holy Spirit, and you can argue with the different terminology, and you know what? I think one of the things that happens in theology is we start to argue over nuance and we miss the reality of what God wants to do. Here's the reality. God has more for you. God has more for me. Let me give you an example. You see, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to come upon us again and again and again. Um, on, on Sunday mornings, I go to a church that has three services. And, um, and I always, it's my practice to take my family to the second service. And the reason that is my tradition is because if I go to the 1130 service, like this is kind of a late service, and uh, my pastor knows that there's no fourth service. And so when he preaches, he doesn't care about time. And, and he preaches longer in the third service. And because it starts at 11.30, I always miss the kickoff if I go to the 11.30 service. <laughs> now you know one of my idols, okay? <laughs> go Steelers, all right? Um, I like the Eagles too. So this one Sunday, I, I couldn't get my wife and kids up soon enough and we ended up at the third service. And, um, and so we're in the third service and our worship leader got all anointed. He was repeating <laughs> verses, you know, and he was singing songs way too long. And I'm like, come on, let's get on with it here. I'm looking at my watch. And I'm realizing in the midst of worship that not only is worship gonna go long, but the pastor's gonna get up in this anointing and go further too, okay? And, uh, and, and to be honest, I had a bad attitude. I was standing, I was chewing gum, and I was tapping my foot like this, and I was just irritated. And all of a sudden, I look over at my wife. And when you meet her, if you have met her, you'll know, I mean, she always senses God's presence before me. She always gets it before I do. And she's over there, and she has her hands up, and there's tears streaming down her face, and she is just under the spout where the glory pours out. She's just enjoying the presence of God. And I look past her, and there's my daughter, and she is just trembling in the presence of the Lord, just enjoying his presence. And all of a sudden, the conviction of God comes upon me. And I realize 
that I am an idolatrous man, that I, that I am fixated on things. And I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. And I, I literally pulled my hands out of my pocket and I said, Spirit of God, come. Come and refresh me. You know God is so good. He's so faithful. He forgives us. He cleanses us. And in that moment, it, it, I, I looked around and I saw people begin to experience his presence. Now, I have a theory. I, I love Acts chapter 2. I love the Pentecost narrative. But, and we're going to look at that in just a minute. But sometimes I think it works against us because that's kind of the Shazam wowie moment of the Holy Spirit coming upon people. And we automatically assume that that's what it has to look like every time. But I want you to know, sometimes the Holy Spirit comes like a mighty rushing wind and tongues of fire. And sometimes he comes like a gentle dove and a quiet whisper. And it's all him. And what he's doing is he's empowering you and launching you into the more that he has for you. And so in that moment, I looked around and I saw God's people just to begin to experience his presence. And I developed a theory. And my theory is this. I think the Holy Spirit wants to come upon us every Sunday morning when we worship. I think the Holy Spirit wants to come upon us and refresh us and renew us and take us to a new level every time we come into his presence. And I actually believe that when a group of us get together like this, there's almost like a tipping point where God sticks the toe, uh, his divine toe into the waters of our worship. And he says, ooh, these people want more. And it's almost like this tipping point occurs. You see, it, I think it's just as it's possible to grieve the Holy Spirit and quench the Holy Spirit, it's also possible to welcome and host the Holy Spirit. And when the people of God say, yes, Lord, we want more of you, I think there's a corporate baptism anointing of the Holy Spirit that comes. But one other thing about that. Have you noticed in Scripture that when the Holy Spirit comes upon people, it's almost never on individuals in the New Testament. It's on groups. That the Spirit of the Lord loves to fill groups. Now, we're so individualistic in America, we make it all about us. But the reality is, I think the Spirit of God loves to take groups of people to the next level and give them more. Well, so this is the initiation of the church age. Then we get to Acts chapter 1. And, and this is probably a few weeks after John chapter 20 took place, the events in John 20. And in Acts chapter 1, Jesus is speaking to the disciples, and he says this, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And here's where we discover another principle and, and key element of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit not only comes upon you to help you carry the burden of the people, the Holy Spirit comes upon you to help to carry the mission of God. And so here in Acts chapter 1, Jesus says, listen, wait, don't do anything until my Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, here's another theory I have. I think in this moment, Peter turned to John. They're sitting there. And Peter goes, hey, John, did you hear what he said? He said we're not to go anywhere until the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Well, if that's true, then what happened in John 20? Now, I know John 20 wasn't written yet, okay? I went to seminary, all right? But I, I think, you know, what, what happened? Remember when he said he breathed on us and said to re receive the Holy Spirit? And I think John scratches his head here and he goes, you know, um, I haven't really figured it out theologically. I'm going to wait probably 20, 30 years until I write my gospel, um, <laughs> you know? But, but I think what, oh, by the way, I have a theory on that too. Um, do you know who the last gospel writer to write was? John. John was the last one to write. In fact, all the other disciples were dead. Do you know why John waited until last to write his gospel? So that he could call himself the disciple who Jesus loved. <laughs> Seriously. No extra charge for that, okay? Because if they had still been alive, they'd have been like, he loved us too, John, okay? But they're all dead. I'm going to write my gospel the way I want to write it, okay? So, so I think Peter turns to John and he's like, he's like, um, you know, what's going on? He's saying to wait for more. And John says, look, the only thing I know is this. We can never get stuck in one place that what Jesus is saying is he has more for us. Now, there's a lot of different theological camps on this issue, but here's the one thing that we can all agree on that Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit to carry the mission of God and carry the burden of the people. And no matter where you are, at what stage in your life you're in, the Lord has more for you. And he has a fresh outpouring, a fresh touch, and a fresh ministry of the Holy Spirit he wants to touch you with so that you can touch others for his glory. 
And so we see what happens next. And you know the story that the Spirit is given to carry the burden of the people, but also to carry the mission of our God. And then we get to Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And if you were to go through Acts, and, and we're not going to cover every single passage in Acts, when the Holy Spirit comes upon people, there's always evidence. Now here is where I want to distinguish myself from maybe the Pentecostals, because the Pentecostals believe, and God bless them, I love them, they're my brothers and sisters in Christ, that tongues is always the evidence. And what I would say to that is, I don't think it's limited to just one gift. You see, I think when the Holy Spirit comes upon people, it may be a gift, it may be the fruit of the Spirit, it may be boldness in, in witnessing, but you will know that God has done something in your life. There will be evidence, but I'm a little uncomfortable limiting it to just one particular gift. And so we see the Spirit coming upon these people, and then Peter stands up further down in the chapter, and he begins to preach. He raises his voice and he addresses them and he says, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you and listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning, okay? I actually wanna get a shirt made that says, it's nine o'clock somewhere, Acts 2.15. <laughs> now, if you get that joke, it means you live a little bit in two different worlds. You've been to church and you know Acts 2.15, but you're also familiar with Jimmy Buffett, okay? Anyhow, we'll move on, all right? <laughs> It's only nine o'clock in the morning, but this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. And again, you see that this is moving from exclusive to inclusive. The spirit is being poured out everywhere on young and old men and women that the Lord is saying, I, I want to empower all my children, all my children. And then Peter preaches and he says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, guess what? For those in Philly at GCC in 2017, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Let me show you one other passage and then I'll close with the story. Now, it's worth noting, the disciples did not hoard this gift like they were the only special people to get it. They freely gave and imparted this gift of the Holy Spirit to all who believed. So it wasn't just salvation. You see, salvation is the doorway into the things of God, but what they told people that were coming into this new life in Christ is that there is an empowerment of the Holy Spirit that will come upon you. Let me show you one more passage. In Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, it says this, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, that means that they received the gospel, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers. These are new Christians that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, let me pause there. Um, they had the indwelling and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit because it is impossible to become a Christian without the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the agent of regeneration, bringing your dead spirit into new life. But there was something more they needed of the Holy Spirit. And so they sent them because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now again, here's in essence what this passage is saying. Saying this, God has more for you. Uh, your salvation was wonderful. Your baptism was a, a highlight. But your salvation should not be the pinnacle of your Christian experience. Because your salvation is the doorway into the things of God so that you can do all the things that Jesus has empowered you with his spirit to do. All right, let me share a story and then we'll, we'll pray. When I was a young man, my wife and I were getting ready to take our first church. It was in the, the summer of um, 1986. Yeah, that's a long time ago. 
And we were at this, uh, this Bible camp, a conference in the middle of Pennsylvania, a camp called Mahaffey Camp. It's in the middle of nowhere, along the Susquehanna River. And we're sitting there one night in this tabernacle, and there's a man up there preaching on the filling of the Holy Spirit. And I remember I was about uh, 23, 24 years of age, and, uh, and I, I grabbed Wanda's hand, and I said, honey, we've got to go forward because we can't start this church ministry. And we, we had a church that we were going to start to be the youth pastor and young adults pastor at in Connecticut <clears throat> in September. And I said, we can't do this without the filling of the Holy Spirit. We need more. And so we, we went forward to the front and we knelt down at the altar and, and this man came up and he, uh, he said, what do you want? And I said, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because we're starting ministry and, and, and we can't do it on our own. I don't want to end up frustrated like Moses. I, wa I want to experience all that God has for us. And so this guy said, okay. And he laid hands on us and he said, uh, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he prayed something else and it was very simple. And then he said, amen. And I looked up at him and I said, am I, am I filled? <laughs> and he said, yep, you're filled. And I, I pointed at my wife and I said, is she filled? And he said, yep, she's filled. And I said, are you sure? He goes, yep. You receive it by faith. You, 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 don't, you won't feel anything. It's just by faith. Now, folks, let me address something here. We receive all the things of God by faith. But don't say you have it till you have it. In fact, let me, let me pick on a segment of the Christian population. Uh, there's certain people that think we're supposed to name and claim our healing, even when they're not sick. They're like, man, I'm sick as a dog, but I name it and claim it in Jesus' name. And I always want to say name it and claim it over there so I don't catch it from you, okay? <laughs> because don't say you have it until you actualize it. And so I, I'm kneeling there, there at the altar, and, and, and this guy was just afraid that we would try to turn it into, you know, something Pentecostal. And, and really, that wasn't our agenda. We just wanted more of God. And he goes, yep, you're filled. So we get up, and we walked away from the altar. And the next day, Wanda and I got in a rip-roaring knock down, drag out fight. It wasn't that bad, but you weren't there, okay? And uh, <laughs> so we get into this massive argument. And in the middle of the argument, I turned to her and I said, nothing happened to you last night. And then she pointed at me and she goes, nothing happened to you either. I go, I know. <laughs> but you know what that did? That created a hunger in us for more of God. It created a desire to begin to pursue him. And that was in July of 1986. And through that fall, we just got more hungry and more hungry for God. And the things that used to satisfy us no longer satisfied us. And we just began to pursue the Lord and say, God, there's got to be more. We can't do this alone. And, and, and we began to press in. And folks, I read every book I could find on how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'll be honest, some of them were just not helpful. Because I'd read this stuff that said, oh, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you have to read your Bible, you have to pray, you have to fast, you have to repent of all known sin, you have to do this. You have... and, and I remember reading these things going, I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit to do all this stuff. I can't do it on my own. I, I've, I've since come to realize that I think there's only one prerequis prerequisite for the filling of the Holy Spirit for more of God, and that is hunger. Hunger, God, there's got to be more. When the people of God get to a place of desperation like Moses, where they're saying, I can't do this. God, you might as well just kill me now. If you really love me, take me home. Or they get to a place where they realize that the mission of God is so massive and so huge that they cannot do it on their own. They say, God, there's got to be more. And, and that's the place that God got me to that fall of 1986 and through the winter. And, and out of the blue, my elders in this little church in Connecticut where we, where we were serving sent me to a conference. They sent me to a conference out in California, and it was not my denomination. It was a, more of a charismatic denomination, and to be honest, I was a little nervous. Uh, I was also nervous because I'm an East Coast guy, and I was going to the left coast, okay? <laughs> and, and so I, I went out to this conference, and man, I was so hungry for God that every time they gave an altar call, man, I went up to the front. So Monday night, I went up to the front. I wanted to receive prayer, and one of the ministry team guys... He, he had a badge on. He said he was a trained member of the ministry team. His name was Joe, headed on his badge. He comes up to me and he goes, are you ready to be filled with the love of the Father? And I said, yep, that's why I'm here. And he went, nah, you're not ready yet. And I went, what? He said, nah, you're not ready. Come back tomorrow. Maybe I'll pray for you tomorrow. 
and he walks away from me. <laughs> like, who trained the ministry team here? Man? This guy. <laughs> so the next night, I go up to the front. Who comes up to me but Joe Langford? That was his name, Joe Langford. He comes up and he goes, are you ready to be filled with the love of the Father? And I go, yep, I'm ready. He goes, no, nah, I don't think you're ready. I go, well, 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 at least pray for me to get ready. He goes, no, nah, you'll be okay. Come back tomorrow. Maybe I'll pray for you tomorrow. He walked away from me again. So this happened Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night. By Thursday night, I'm ready to punch this guy, you know, <laughs> proving that I hadn't been filled with the Holy Spirit yet, okay? And uh, every night, he does the same thing. No, nah, you're not ready. Come back tomorrow. So it's finally, it's Friday night. It's the last night of the conference. And, uh, and the guy that was leading said, I want the pastors to come up first because God wants to empower you. He wants to give you more of his presence to empower you, to take you to the next level. God has more for you. So man, I'm, I'm the first one up there, but I was kind of hiding behind people, hoping that this guy Joe wouldn't see me. I was literally praying, Lord, give me anyone else on the ministry team but that guy Joe. <laughs> but who finds me but Joe? <laughs> okay. Now this is February of 1987. It's more than 30 years ago. But friends, I can remember this moment like it was yesterday. And I'm standing up there in the front on the last night of this conference and Joe comes walking up to me and he asks me the same question that he'd been asking me all week. Son, are you ready to receive the love of the Father? But this night, when I went to answer him, I tried to say yes and my voice broke and I just started to weep. And he said, ah, you're ready. And he put his arms around me. Now, I don't understand what the blockage was, what the obstacles were, what he saw. But he, I, I sensed that he was waiting until God had prepared me for that moment. And as I began to weep, and in my brokenness, I began to say, God, I, I'm so desperate for you. He put his arms around me and he said, Father, fill him. Now, what I'm about to share with you is descriptive, not prescriptive. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. When we have an experience with God, the mistake we make is we start to prescribe to other people that it will look exactly like it looked for us. And when you read the scripture and when you see the way God deals with people, he deals with us all in very unique ways. Like I said before, sometimes it's a mighty rushing wind, tongues of fire. Sometimes it's a gentle dove, quiet whisper. But however he comes, it's him. And so we can describe, but we should never prescribe. And so when he prayed for me, it was, the only way I can describe it, it was, it was like the top of my head got poured, pulled off and the love of God, like a waterfall, started to flood my heart, flood my life. And I stood there, I, I didn't speak in tongues, I didn't fall over, but he filled me with his love, he sealed me by his spirit. I went home from that conference, I got off the plane and Wanda picked me up and, and she looked at me and she said, something happened to you. I go, yeah, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. She said, do we believe in that? I said, we do now. <laughs> you know what, that summer, Wanda and I went to another conference in California because we thought God lived in California. Because <laughs> I'll be honest, Connecticut was pretty dry in 1987, man. It was not working real well. So we go out there together, and Joe and his wife Sue got around Wanda and I. And they prayed for us that we would receive a baptism, a filling of the Holy Spirit on our marriage. Now, uh, some of you are like, well, where's that in Scripture? Well, remember I told you, we kind of individualize things. The Spirit of God loves to fill groups of people. That's the way he does it in Acts. That's the way he does it uh, with his disciples. That's the way he does it with the 70 and the 120. The Spirit of God is poured out on groups. And dare I say, marriages and families, that when you pray, we can pray, Father, would you pour out your spirit on us as a church in a new and a fresh way? Would you pour out your spirit on my marriage? Would you pour out your spirit on my brothers and sisters, on my siblings, on, on my friends, Lord? In, in fact, if you look at history, the move of God, the revival of God has always swept across college campuses. Have you ever noticed that? That the spirit of God loves to move on groups of people. And I think it's when a group of students, just like you guys, say, God, there's got to be more. This can't be as good as it gets. And so, Jesus, would you fill us? Would you refresh us? Would you give us more? Would you stand with me?